Hello and welcome back. Here we're going to look at an exercise, uh, another test on single population mean. This time, however, we're going to be doing uh, two tailed tests. And in fact, this problem is uh, kind of actually two problems in one. So I'm going to split this into two separate videos, and we'll do uh, we'll do each of these uh, individually. So let's uh, let's just get into it and uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so here we're looking at lumber uh, lumber yard produces batches of two by fours in lengths of 8 feet and 12 feet. So I think for this video I'll just look at the 8 foot exercise and then we'll do another video for the 12 foot uh, test. So uh, here we're going to look at uh, the 96 inch uh, 2 by 4s Each batch contains 50. There's a sample size. Because the lumber is being used primarily for framing walls and construction, it's imperative that they be accurate. We don't want them to be too short or too long as this will cause delays in construction. So the lumber yard knows the standard deviation of the 8 foot lengths is 0.82 inches. And I'll skip over the 12 foot stuff. Uh, on the first day of each month, we take a batch out of production to measure the accuracy. And so here's our sample mean for that 8 foot um, batch. And we're going to use a level of significance alpha 05 to test to determine whether or not the two lengths of lumber are being cut accurately. So let's uh, Let's just produce our null and alternative first. It's often so much easier when we're doing two-tailed tests, the formulation of the null and alternative, because we don't have to worry so much about are we looking for something that's greater than or something that's less than. There's only one option uh, when we know that we're doing a two-tailed test, and that is, is it equal to? Uh, and here our hypothesis to value is 96 inches. So it's equal to, or it's not equal to. Now. In order to, to know if it didn't tell us that we're doing a two-tailed test, how could we tell? Well, again, the, the, the problem always has clues, right? Here again, that last sentence says, we want to test to determine whether or not the, the lumber are being cut accurately. And we want them to be cut to 96 inches. So if it, we want it to be cut accurately, that means we don't want it to be cut l too long. We don't want it to be cut too short. We want it to be fairly precise to 96 inches. So that's the extent of the clues. Is it 96 inches or is it not 96 inches? Now, moving on, we have our level of significance uh, is 0 0.05. Okay, so here we have our null and alternative formulated. We've justified that. if our evidence supports the null, then we know we're on target, everything's accurate. If our evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, then there's a problem. There's a, in, an issue with the accuracy and we'll have to stop production and, and take corrective measures. Uh, so now we want to calculate our test statistic. I'll get rid of this both tests because we're going to do them separately. So for the 8 foot, or the 96 inch 2 by 4s my sample mean was right here. So this is 95.8 inches minus 96 divided by, here was that standard deviation for the 8 foot. I know it's 8 foot because it's got that little subscript there. 0 0.82 divided by the square root. Our sample size was up here 50. So let's get our calculator out. So 95.8 minus 96 divided by 0.82 over root 50 equals negative 1.70, that'll round to 73, I guess. Negative 1.73. Okay, so there we've got that test statistic. Use the p-value approach to draw our conclusions. Okay, so now we want to go to our uh, z-tables, and we want to find that value of negative 1.73. So here we go, z, negative 1.7, is right there, 1.73, so that comes together, and here we are, right here. So I've got this probability of 0 0.0418. Now, a very common mistake when we're dealing with a two-tailed test is that students will very often uh, give that probability as their final answer, as their p-value. We always have to remember when you're performing a two-tailed test, we want to always double that probability. So we want to multiply this by 2 because we're concerned here with a two-tailed test 
of the probability of obtaining a test statistic that is too large or too small. Remember that p-value, you can think of that p-value as the probability of obtaining a test statistic at least as unlikely as the one that we've obtained. So here I have a test statistic of negative 1.7. So this is the probability of obtaining a test statistic at least as unlikely uh, as the one that we have to the left or less than, but values up here to the right of positive 1.7, those are also just as unlikely. And so we want to incorporate that probability as well. Remember, this is a, a measure of the, the, the strength of evidence uh, against our null hypotheses, or actually in this favor, maybe in, in favor of our null hypotheses. So our p-value here is going to be two times that probability. So two times 0 0.0418. So my p-value for this two-tailed test is 0 0.0836. So I'll come back here. I have a p-value of 0 0.0836. Okay, so what does that mean uh, as far as our conclusion for this test? Well, our level of significance is 0.05. That's my tolerance towards a type one error. Now, I could choose to reject. Forget about the rejection rule here for a second. I could simply choose, I'm going to reject. Well, if I did reject, my exposure here to a type one error is greater than what I'm comfortable with. Uh, it's too high. I, I, could, I could reject, but I'm not comfortable with an 8% chance of committing a type 1 error. I'm only comfortable with a 5% chance of committing a type 1 error. So with that in mind, I am not going to reject because our rejection rule, remember that rejection rule, always is to reject if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha. In this case, it is not. And so I am going to support the null hypotheses. My evidence shows that we appear to be uh, on target, or at least I can't say that it's different than 96 uh, inches. So that's, uh, that's it for our conclusion here. Verify the conclusion using a critical value approach. Okay, so if we use the critical value approach, uh, we go to our Z tables, and now the critical value approach we would reject if that test statistic is greater than or equal to not Z alpha as it would be in a one tail test, but Z alpha by two, because I'm also going to reject if it's smaller than the negative Z alpha by two. So what that means, we're testing for equality here. So that means that my rejection space, I'm gonna reject if it's too large, if it appears to be too large, to have come from our hypothesized distribution. And I'm going to reject if it appears to be too small to have come from our hypothesized distribution. So this space in here, this is my do not reject space. And my level of significance alpha defines the size of that rejection space, which means that this area and this area, it's not totally equal, I guess, forgive me. Let's go like this. So this space here, must be equal to alpha. So the total area has to be equal to alpha. So that means in the upper tail, I have alpha divided by two, and in the lower tail, I have alpha divided by two, so that together the size of my rejection region is equal to alpha. So alpha divided by two is 0 0.025, so I can come through this table and there I find it's exactly right there. So that gives me a critical value Z alpha by two plus or minus 1.96, one of the more common values that we'll pull out of this table. Uh, so I'll reject if my test statistic is larger than positive 1.96 or smaller than negative 1.96. And so when we come back here with our test statistic, where do I have room here? My test statistic of uh, Z alpha by two is 1.96. And here's my test statistic of negative 1.73. Well, again, if I draw this out, here's positive 1.96.
here's negative 1.96. Everything in between is the do not reject space. Here's my reject if it's too big. Here's my reject if it's too small. And negative 1.7, I can see is somewhere just right in here. So that falls right into that do not reject space. And so that, again, that's consistent with what we found using the p-value approach. Uh, and so that's good. We should always get exactly the same conclusion regardless of which uh, rejection rule we apply, p-value or critical value. So good, we got that interpreter conclusion. So here I have insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. I am unable to show that we are not achieving our um, our objective of 96 inches. Uh, part F, verify your findings using the confidence interval approach. Okay, so that's a little bit different. What we're gonna do now is develop a confidence interval estimate for the true unknown population mean. So you may recall from chapter eight, I believe, or module eight, we had this formula for developing confidence intervals uh, like this one. And so that allowed us to develop this interval around that point estimate such that we were, in, in this case, 95% confident. I say 95 because it's one minus alpha is 0.95. 95% confident that the true population mean exists between some lower limit and some upper limit. So we can produce a confidence interval and we can compare it to this test because this is a two-tailed test and the results will be uh, perfectly comparable. So let's, uh, let's go through these calculations. So our point estimate here was uh, 0. Point, uh, no, not 0, uh, 95.8 inches plus or minus this critical value we've already obtained, 1.96 times that standard error, 0 0.82 divided by root 40. And let's get that calculator out here. I'll just calculate the margin of error. So 1.96 times 0.82 divided by root 40 equals, so 0.254. So this is plus or minus 0.254. Now I'll calculate the limits. So the lower limit is going to be 95.8 minus 0.254. So that's 95.55. 95.55. And the upper limit, where'd my calculator go? 95.8 plus 0 0.254, 96.05. Okay, so now what we can say is I'm 95% confident that the true population mean exists between these two limits. I don't know where it is, but I'm 95% confident that it's somewhere in there. How is this consistent? Or in other words, how can we verify our findings with this critical value, or with this confidence interval approach? Well, here my hypothesized value is 96. And when we performed the test, we said, well, our evidence doesn't allow us to reject that. I'm unable to say that it's different from 96. And this confidence interval confirms that because as we can see, 96 is a possible value within that confidence interval. So the implication here is not that we can say that it is 96 inches, but I can't say that it is not 96 inches because within that interval estimate, 96 is definitely a possibility. So I can't rule it out. Uh, the true population mean is somewhere between 95.55, 96.05, 96 is a possibility, and so that's how it is consistent with the results of that test. Okay, so that's it. Uh, we're going to come back. Actually, I'm going to do this problem again, except we'll look at the uh, 12 foot length and uh, see if we come up with some different, uh, some different kind of results here. Okay, thank you so much for watching. Bye bye.